Welcome back to Equity TV. Now joining us is Cal State, Pres uh, Cal State Bakersfield President, Dr. Horace Mitchell. Uh, welcome, President Mitchell. Well, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. Great. Well, I have to say, one of the most fascinating things about you is the fact that you received your bachelor's degree the same year the Civil Rights Act passed. That's amazing. So, but before we get to that, let's uh -huh. backtrack a little bit. All right. uh, tell me about uh, how you got there. What, who inspired you to get an education? Well, um, I grew up in a family where neither of my parents had gone to college. And so um, my mother in particular, though, uh, wanted me to go to college because uh, she had seen and people had said, you know, he's kind of smart. We think he ought to go to college. <laughs> and so she uh, agreed with that. And uh, there were people around my high school and, you know, in my community who said I ought to go to college, you know, just because of what they observed of my study habits and things like that. And it made sense to me. And, uh, and so I decided at a very early age that I need to go to college. So right. it wasn't just motivation from, you know, f close friends and families. You had motivation from strangers, too, or uh, I wouldn't say teachers? total strangers, teachers, okay. counselors, church people. And, but it's cross-cultural. Very, very cross-cultural. Okay. Primarily African-American, but still very much cross-cultural. Uh, there was one instance, for example, of uh, a white high school counselor at my high school who uh, got the results of intelligence tests, and she said, this doesn't look right, you know, oh. and she said, I think you ought to take the test again, uh, and I did, and she was very happy with the outcome. She says, ah, this is more like what I think. Oh, so she, so she didn't think that you scored too high. She thought you scored too low. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Her, her sense was that I should have scored higher on the test than I did, and so she wanted me to take it again. So. Wow. Well, that's mm -hmm. great motivation. I mean, that's the first, I think that would be the first step for any student is yeah. just to have that <clears throat> push from, from people. Because a lot mm -hmm. of, like uh, Professor Johnson said earlier, there's a lot of self-doubt when you're aspiring for higher education. Absolutely. So that was really good. Yeah. Um, so how was Martin, speaking of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., since it's a holiday, yes. how did he inspire you? Well, <clears throat> in fact, I was the uh, guest speaker this morning for the annual Martin Luther King uh, breakfast. Oh. And uh, in the course of that, I talked about the fact that Dr. King has always been one of my uh, role models, uh, particularly with his ideas about servant leadership, you know, that uh, he had this one speech called the drum, ma drum major instinct. And uh, it's all about people wanting to be seen as being great. And what he said is that we can all be great because we can all serve that greatness is about a willingness to serve others. Uh, and, and so I, that has, uh, you know, been something that uh, I've noticed and uh, I appreciated about him. And in fact, I was mentioning in my presentation this morning that on my wall in my office at CSUB, there's a plaque that says, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in times of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. And that's been on my wall at four universities over four decades because well, it's, it's what I think is important. Yeah, that's when your true strength and, and person comes out is in, in the face of challenge. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Wow, so you decided uh, to go to college. So was it also to serve? Well, uh, <clears throat> let me back up a little bit. Okay. Uh, people had sort of said to me, and my grade sort of reflected, that I, that I was pretty good in math and science, uh -huh. okay? And so the notion was that I should be a doctor, Okay, I didn't necessarily buy into I need to be a doctor. I did buy into I need to do things to, to help people. Yeah. But I went into uh, college as a pre-med. But okay. after a couple of years, and particularly when I started taking psychology courses, I decided mm, I don't want to do medicine. I want to do psychology. All right. But the problem was that, um, you know, doing medicine, you finish with a medical degree and, you know, you're all set. Whereas if you finish a bachelor's degree in psychology, that's good, but that doesn't necessarily give you the kind of career you want. And so you need to go to uh, the master's level in order to have a job as a psychologist. And then once I got into that, um, spending time in the university and I, uh, <clears throat> well, I continued my master's degree where I had started my bachelor's. And 
at the same time, quite to my surprise, uh, when I started my master's degree, I was offered a position at the university as assistant dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And this is at Washington University in St. Louis, you know, one of the top liberal arts uh, colleges in the country, also has a great medical school and other things. And so uh, <clears throat> they decided, as uh, in discussions with me, that I wanted as a condition of my working in that role that they would pay for my the rest of my master's degree and then I decided to do a PhD and they decided to cover that too. Oh wow. And so I ended up finishing the PhD with no debt. Why not, so. right? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good deal to me. It was a, it was a great deal. It was a great university and actually both my wife Barbara and I have three degrees from Washington University in St. Louis. Oh my gosh. Well, you know. I mean, I'd be a little intimidated going into your house, I'm just saying. <laughs> I don't have three degrees. <laughs> so, during a summer break uh, mm -hmm. in college, you went to temp agency for work. That right. was an interesting story. Yeah, well, um, you know, uh, my wife, well, my wife to be and I decided that we would get married during the late summer uh, before my junior year, all right? And I had a job with the YMCA, you know, working with some youths, doing different things, uh, taking them to camps and things. And it was a good job. I enjoyed it. Um, but it ended, and I still had time, and I needed to work. All right, and so I decided, you know, what can I do? Uh, probably a temporary agency is going to be the best thing. So I looked up this one temporary agency in St. Louis where we were living, and um, uh, they had an address, and I went to that address, except that the agency was in the alley behind that address. Oh, okay. So I go, uh, I'm, I don't know. And then there were these people there all waiting like a cattle call to say, okay, who can do this, who can do that? And people raise their hands. And I said, no, this isn't me. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing this. So I left. All right. Then I thought about it and I said, wait a minute. Uh, I need to earn some more money. I'm getting married, <laughs> you know. And so I went back the next day and um, uh, I, I had this sort of collegiate look, unlike some of the other people, some of whom appear to be homeless. Mm -hmm. And so they had a call, like, anybody can drive a truck, you know, and uh, I raised my hand. And, and so they called me up and uh, <clears throat> I took this job uh, driving a truck to move parts from where they were manufactured to where they were being distributed. And so it was interesting and it worked fine and I made the income I needed to do what I needed to do, but it was that initial reaction of this is not me, you know, to a realization that, wait a minute, you know, this is something I need to do, so let's make it work. So moral of the story is put your ego aside. You got to do what you have to do. That's exactly right. So even you, when, it, when it comes to college. Right, yeah. You, you got you to decide what's important. Yeah. You know. So how did it feel to receive your bachelor's degree the same year the Civil Rights Act was passed? Well, uh, <clears throat> it, it was great, you know, and uh, it, it turns out that uh, my wife and I were married on the third anniversary of the March on Washington. Oh, wow. August 28th uh, for us, uh, two, uh, 1966, when the march was 1963. So many and symbolic so, milestones for very, you. Very much so. Very wow. much so. And, of course, given the critical role that uh, Dr. King played in uh, having that passed uh, was very significant as well. So, uh, unfortunately, I didn't get an opportunity to personally meet Dr. King, mm -hmm. as some people did, but uh, I was always aware of what he was doing, and, and I looked at what he did, but my own family circumstances in St. Louis mm -hmm. just didn't get me to the March on Washington or other kinds of places. It's okay. You're still a walking symbol that, you know, despite challenges, I mean, segregation, you oh, yeah. can still make your dream come true. It's amazing. No, oh, absolutely. So you often ask young men a question. Are you a player or a pawn? <laughs> what do you mean by that? Right. Well, <clears throat> this first came up when I was the guest speaker for... Uh, a, a program called Project Best, uh, Black Excellence and Scholarship and Teaching. It's a, a program 
that is run by the current high school district, and CSUB is involved in supporting that as well, and a lot of community people. And so I was a speaker for one of the graduating classes a few years ago, and we were talking about what it means uh, to become a man, you know, and, and the responsibility that you take. And it's a matter of do things happen to you or do you make things happen? So you know? things that happen to you would be a pawn? Right. And things that you make happen, you're a player. There you go. Right. And so, ah. and so that's what I presented it to them. I said, now, you know, um, I want to talk about pawns and players. And I made it clear with them that I wasn't talking about players, you know, <laughs> which is a, sort of a slang term for somebody who really uh -huh. knows how to manipulate things. And that's not what I was interested in. It's like uh, <clears throat> a pawn says, well, I couldn't do this because of that, or, or this person kept me from doing that, or this happened to me, as opposed to uh, people who are players. And these are people who have a concept of what they want their future to be like and who take proactive steps to make it happen. And so after I finished describing uh, to these young men uh, pawns and players, I said, okay, I want all of the project best pawns to please stand. Nobody stood up. <laughs> well, they're smart. They wouldn't. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and so I said, okay, so now I want all the project best players to stand up. And they all stood up very proudly. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, that's because, an amazing moment. You know, because that's what you want. You want them to recognize that their future is in their hands. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of times what I believe is that people see the future very passively. And by yes. that I'm meaning the future comes, the future yes. happens. And so what I say to young people is, yes, the future will come time-wise, but it won't be any different than it is now unless you do something yep. to work toward a vision that you have about what your future wants to look like, needs to look like. So you're not a victim of your circumstance, but you hold your future in your hand and you can control that. That's exactly right. Wonderful message. Are you a player or a pawn? Think about that, okay? Well, that's it for us. Thank you so much, uh, President Mitchell, for your time. Uh, well, next week we'll be back with Equity TV at Bakersfield College, same place, same time. So join us then. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.